Okay. So, do everybody see and hear me well? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yesterday we saw uh, modern CDCL SAT solvers. So the idea of, uh, in particular, we emphasize the role of big jumping and learning. And uh, this was um, really a game changer in SAT solving because allowed to dramatically uh, reduce uh, the, to improve the performances of orders of orders magnitude. And what, it was what made uh, really SAT uh, the, the leading technology in solving uh, and big complete problems. Um, well, uh, big jumping and learning was the measure break breakthrough. I think that there are a few, I will um, conclude this part, but just uh, mentioning a few more uh, improvements uh, who were uh, introduced uh, um, in, uh, in such solving. Um, the first one important fact uh, is uh, that you not only, um, to before, uh, before uh, starting the search, but also sometimes also during the search, uh, you do some formula simplifications, which I'm going to explain to you. Well, the first important fact uh, that you do is that uh, you sub you detect and remove uh, subsumed clauses. Remember that very often uh, problems, uh, in particular big ones, uh, are not generated by human beings are generated by encoding by some automatic encoder of some other problem and often uh, uh, it's not always easy to write an encoder and to detect uh, um, to detect uh, redundancies or uh, some uh, uh, useless um, or, or simplification could be done and this is done instead by the process typically the processing of, um, of a SAT solver Set times uh, even by in processing. That is, during a search, uh, uh, the formula reduces to some situation in which some redundancies show up. One of the typical, uh, well, one first uh, important uh, uh, redundancy that you may have within a uh, SAT solver is the presence of subsumed clauses. That is, <coughs> clauses which uh, um, contain. Uh, each other, right? You can think of clauses as a, as a, as a set, right? And uh, a set of literals. And if a set of literal contains the other set of, another set of literal, then uh, the, the smallest one is stronger. Remember that we have, a, this is a disjunct, a clause is a disjunction. So this disjunct here entails this disjunct here, right? This is stronger than this. Okay, because this is okay, this is this or something else, right? This is this one is this close here or L3. So this is stronger than this, okay, and this is weaker than this. So when uh, you detect, so when uh, you you may detect and so soon close and remove uh, the, uh, the weakest one, okay. When you realize that these two formulas are equivalent, right? So this is yeah. soon. Also, of course, the, in doing that, you have to sort uh, literals inside the clauses are typically sorted according to some criteria. Okay, so that is easy to detect, uh, easier to detect uh, the um, containments. Okay, so if this is the case, uh, you you do this, right? So you do subsume clause, and and often you do that also do during the search. Another fact that very often uh, during search or uh, from the beginning, uh, you often, uh, uh, there's often a presence of uh, uh, equivalent literals. Why this is the case? Well, for the very same reason that I mentioned before, most often uh, um, formulas are a result of encodings. And these are general encodings for general situation. And maybe in some situation, the, those encoding may introduce uh, names uh, for something else and maybe this something else is still a literal okay so you have a, a literal whose name is a literal uh, which is the name of another literal okay so this means that you have uh, uh, 
lots of equivalences between literals inside a formula. And uh, of course, this, uh, uh, this is not immediate, always immediate to detect, and this uh, uh, worsen uh, the, the search. So one typical preprocessing thing to do, but also during processing, is eliminate, detect, and collapse equivalent literals. So what to do is uh, you build, well, the equivalent uh, thing of building, finding uh, uh, the, ch the chain of implication of single literal implications, okay? Remember, a binary clause, so substantially take every binary clause. Remember that binary clause can always be seen uh, as a, an implication as two implications between two literals. If I have L1 or L2, this means not L1 or not L1 implies L2, and also uh, not L2 implies L1. Okay, right? So binary, you you can build the implication graph on induced by binary clauses. Okay, and in this graph. You detect you can detect the strongly connected cycles. Okay, you, you detect cycles there, right? If you have a cycle between literals, means that A implies B, B implies C, and C implies A. This means that A, B, and C are equivalent. All right. So yeah. you detect all cycles, so uh, strongly connecting cycles, strongly connected components are equivalence classes of literals. Remember, recall that uh, detecting uh, uh, strongly connected cycles, in strongly connected components in a, in, a, um, in a graph is a linear operation, okay? And also here is even much better because typically those groups are very small, okay? So what you do is that you detect those strongly connected components and you perform a substitution, so you keep for every equivalence class of literal, you keep only one and perform and substitute all such literal with the, the representative of the, of the uh, equivalent class and then simplify the formula accordingly. Okay, for instance, if you have a subsum closer, obvious clauses, uh, um, valid clauses, you remove them. And then you perform a unit and a pure literal and the elimination and the equivalence clause and the drop valid, valid clauses and so on and so forth. And you redo this until uh, no, no, notice that doing this simplification may be may cause other literal to become to become equivalent. Okay, and so you do that until uh, until a fix, you reach a fixed point. So until no more simplification is possible. So for instance, if you have a situation like that, so you have that your formula is given by the conjunction of uh, three binary clauses like L2 or L1 and L3 or L2 and not L1 or L3 plus uh, other pieces of the formula. So in, in between the formula, there are these three clauses, okay? Now this induce, induces a cycle because this means that L2 implies L1 and L3 implies L2 and, uh, and uh, L1 implies L3, so it's a cycle, a free cycle between uh, uh, L1, L2, L3, okay? So what you can do is decide that L1, L2, L3 is, are equivalent. And so you decide that uh, you, you keep uh, only one of them, right? So you substitute, uh, uh, oh, well, I suspect here, well, actually the implication is on the opposite way. You keep a representative of that. So the implication here is the wrong way. Okay. Uh, uh, no, no, well, here is meant that uh, you substitute L2 with, uh, with L1, okay? So this is in the sense of assignment, okay? You substitute all instances L2 with L1 and all instances of L3 and of L1, and also the, the negation, also the negation. And then you simplify the formula accordingly, okay? Well, this is, uh, may come out su surprisingly effective in some, in some application, in particular in those coming from encodings, uh, uh, automated encoding like informal verification, where sometimes uh, uh, there are lots of variable defining something else. So for instance, if a variable defines some a binary, a formula coming from the combi a binary operator applied to some uh, uh, other two literals, but one of those literals is assigned to some value, for instance. 
then this comes as uh, a literal being a definition of another literal. Okay, and this is uh, so. This is uh, uh, quite effective uh, in in many applications. Uh, also, well, uh, well, sometimes uh, there are uh, implicit uh, unit clauses. So. Um, I mentioned before that uh, when I say the use, I meant mostly uh, unit propagation. Actually, there are some operations that you can do which are sort of extensions of unit propagations. To some extent, you, there are some implicit unit clauses. Okay. So, for instance, consider the case that you have uh, two clauses like uh, L2 or L1 and L2 or not L1, right? Well, you may notice that uh, if you resolve these two clauses, uh, you have L2, which is a unit. Okay, so this is a sort of implicit unit clause. Okay, so sometimes there are some typical patterns that uh, some solver are able to recognize, like like this, for instance, and apply some uh, in basic steps very quick. Uh, and basic step of a resolution and then can simplify and cause some unit clause. So causes detect some deterministic steps, right? So because here, no matter what, uh, it's, a, it's a deterministic to assign L2 to true, right? So you cannot have a model with L2 equal false. Okay? So there are techniques to, de to detect them and uh, to resolve. Uh, well, another global uh, uh, important factor in DPLL and more recently in the CDCL uh, is uh, the choice of literals. What, which kind of literal you pick? Okay, which, which variable you pick and which truth value you give to that variable? Okay, here there are, well, in LL, in uh, all the DPLL, there were a variety of uh, uh, decision heuristics. There, the main idea was uh, uh, to give uh, a bigger value to literal which occur most in the smaller clauses. Think about that. Uh, the smaller a clause, the um, uh, the more informative the clause is, right? Because a clause uh, substantially blocks. So if you have n variables and a clause uh, as a length k, uh, a clause of length k, k uh, cuts uh, two to the n minus k candidate models. Okay? Right? A clause is the negation of a of uh, uh, is very small partial assignment. And that partial assignment, if, if of length k, uh, is representative of two to the n minus k total truth assignment, right? So the, the shorter the close, uh, the more informative, okay? Saying A is much more informative than say A or B, okay, because the first says that uh, no uh, a uh, not a cannot be a model. No, no model with not a can be a model. Okay. The second one says that no model with uh, not a and not b can be a model. Okay, which is less informative. Is a uh, half as informative. Okay. So the the information so the pruning power of every clause. Uh, decreases exponentially with its length okay so typically heuristics gave try to assign uh, uh, two values first so tend uh, to consider more important the variables uh, in uh, occurring in small clauses okay because they were much more uh, they were assumed to have a, a bigger pruner, pruning uh, value. So they tended to uh, use some criterion to assign them uh, um, uh, e earlier than others. 
completely different techniques was that of Sadzi, uh, who did some forward checking, so to say. So tried to see, um, tried to see which variable could produce uh, the best pruning power by, by means of unipropagation. This was extremely expensive, but uh, typically caused a lot of uh, uh, cut search. This was proposed long ago. Nowadays, uh, uh, since uh, so all those apply to standard old uh, DPLL. Nowadays, uh, the leading uh, uh, the leading uh, techniques to pick a variable are variations of uh, what's called VSIDS. So variable state independent decaying sum. So substantially, interestingly enough, the score, so every liter was given a score, is given a score, but this given, uh, this, this score is not updated at every decision as it used to be, but is updated only after, uh, at the end of every branch. So only one some branch uh, is uh, detected unsatisfied. So every time you, you, you falsify close and before starting uh, the, um, the conflict analysis. And here the idea is that uh, you give uh, higher scores to uh, variables which uh, uh, belong to uh, recently learned clauses. Okay, so that's uh, the, so when uh, you learn the new clauses, you give uh, some uh, you add some score to the variable occurring there okay and that score is decreased exponentially progressively as time uh, go ahead so this means that the recently the variables occurring recently um learn the clauses way more have a bigger weight than the others and the intuition is that you want to keep the search local so you don't want to uh, your so if you have uh, 100,000 uh, variables, you don't want uh, your set solver to jump from completely different zones in, uh, in, in the search space. You want to try to stay local in some way, uh, reason down. So, so typically uh, the va variables uh, uh, have a role in different zones uh, of, uh, of the formula, right? So there are, variables which are very far away so consider the, the, a dependency graph okay where uh, every arc every node is a variable and uh, every arc uh, is and you have an arc whenever two variables occur in the same clause there are some variables which are really far away in this graph interdependency graph so you a variable interacts with another variable if it occurs in the same clause, okay? You may have a, a big chain of graph, a big chains of uh, interdependencies. Substantially, you want uh, to choose, go on choosing uh, variable which are near to each other. You don't want to jump from extreme parts of, of this graph. So that's more or less the intuition of that. Also, um, as a another technique which is often used, uh, I just mentioned them just for your curiosity, is uh, you trend, uh, you tend to keep uh, track of the, the last truth assignment in the sense that when you pick a variable, uh, if you can, you give uh, he, you give it the the value which was last assigned to her in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, um, uh, truth assignment, okay? So suppose uh, the last uh, branch, uh, the last branch uh, variable A was given value false, okay? In, um, in the recent, so suppose now you have to decide, uh, you have backtracked and then you find a new branch and then you, you pick variable A and you have to decide the truth value to give it. Uh, you look, you keep track of the last total truth assignment you give for every variable you end it, ten, if you can, tend to give the last uh, variable, the last value you gave it. And the reason is that you want to keep the search local. Okay, you don't want uh, 
the shutter shoulder to, to jump from area to other area. Okay, but this is just uh, generic intuitions. Another important fact, uh, uh, which is important in SATA restarts, they were introduced by Gomez and Selman uh, years ago. Um, so substantially, sometimes uh, the, the SAT solver gets stuck into, into search in some bad area of the search space, right? And it really goes on, goes on, goes on, goes on, goes on in, uh, uh, in trying to improve in an area which is hopeless. So from time to time, according to some heuristic, the search, solver, the, the search is blocked and uh, the stack is uh, uh, reset and uh, the, uh, the start restarts again from scratch. This is called restarts. And the intuition is due based on some, some statistical analysis, uh, knowing that uh, the probability of having a, pro a solution is not normal, but is something similar to a log normal. Uh, well, you may say, well, but if I restart, this is going to redo the, the same pro the same search. No, because in the meantime, you have learned clauses. Okay. So very often, uh, so uh, when you restart, uh, he will go in a different way due to the different search that you've done. It's not, it's not supposed to redo the same search. Okay. Uh, now, nowadays, uh, such solvers restart uh, quite quick, quite uh, often according to some heuristics. So, for instance, if uh, you have recently, you have uh, the last n uh, branches uh, that you have performed. Uh, so, in the last uh, n. Uh, the last uh, n uh, steps okay you have never been higher than uh, your um, decision level has never been smaller than um, 10 10000 this means that you are trying to sir, go ahead in a very on a very low detail so you are not able to prune the search and jump much higher so if the reason and branches, you have not been able to back jump much higher. That seem this seems to suggest that you are stuck in uh, in some bad area of the search space. So the search solver tells you tells to detect that and restarts from scratch. Okay, this is all for I would say CDCL search solvers. We'll get back uh, to reuse it in a, in a few uh, in a few uh, a few consideration. I would say tomorrow. Uh, I just uh, mention. Uh, I wanted to mention a couple of important facts. So we all know that uh, SATA is MP complete, right? Uh, However, there are two important cases of uh, uh, tractable SAT. Okay, so two subcases of SAT which are whose solution is polynomial, and those are a Horn formula, so the problem is Horn SAT, and two CNF formula, so two, so also known as two SAT. I wanted to point out this. I spent a few minutes to to say something about those cases because. They may be of, um, not only of theoretical interest, but also practical interest. Okay, what is a Horn formula? Okay, a uh, Horn formula is a CNF formula such that every clause is a, uh, is a Horn, Horn clause. A Horn clause is a clause in which you have at most one positive literal. Okay, maybe none. Okay. But a horn clause is something which in every clause, in every, so a horn formula is um, a horn a formula in which in every clause you have at most one positive literal. Okay, so this is a horn clause, right? Because you have one literal here, only one literal here. You have none here, fine. Okay, 
and you have one, one positive integer. But notice that you may have also unit integrals. Okay. So why horn closes some of interest? Well, because they occur very frequently in some, uh, well, sometimes it's useful also to encode the polynomial problems in SAT. Okay, because the SAT solver are very good in doing lots of things. Okay, but you have to know that the, the result is polynomial. For instance, typical situation is when you have, um, so horn clause typical represent uh, implication between positive Boolean variables only. So for instance, this clause here can be seen as S2 implies S1. This clause here can be seen as A3 and A4 implies S2. Well, this can be seen as S5, A5, A3, and the four uh, implies false. And this is just uh, well, an implication of itself, right? So this is uh, was uh, very popular in some uh, uh, logic programming, calculi, and uh, something like that. Also, uh, notice that sometimes some situation, some formula which are not horn can be can be reduced to horn by simply renaming. So if you look at this formula here, this is not horn because this clause is not horn. It has two positive literals. However, you may notice that this literal here uh, occurs only in, in totally negative clauses, negative. Of course, negative only total negative clauses. So you can rename B as not A2, okay? And substitute this formula with this. So you substitute this with not A2 and substitute this with, so not A2 with B and substitute not, not A2 with, uh, so A2 with not B and then not A2 with B, okay? You obtain a formula that which is a core, okay? So do you see how to, can anybody see how to solve a horn formula easily? I think we can build a um, graph, um, a cyclic graph, because each literal uh, is um, depends on several others. Yeah, we... that's a good choice. But there is uh, with a yes, this could be a way. But uh, okay. can I make just everything false? Mm, we are near. So well, I can make everything false. If you make everything false, how do you do with the positive uh, unit clauses? You're not yeah. far. You're not far. We can separate all negative clauses. No. No. Well, I think negative. that Enrico was very near to the solution. Assign false to the negative literals with our antecedent of the implication. Yeah, something before that. Yes, but you have oh. something before. Just one, because it's a conjunction. I mean, the idea, the idea of assigning everything, all liters to four, all variables to false, is good if we don't have positive unit clauses. Okay. So what do we have to do before that? Well, I can unit propagate them. Yes. Yes. So the idea is very, very simple. You apply a run of unit propagation, run unit propagation until, until you, uh, until fixed point. Notice that it may be, it may be the case that the, your formula is returns on SAT, right? And once uh, you have terminated, if it returns on SAT, of course, uh, this is on SAT. Otherwise, once uh, the formula return, they are still ordered, of course, and you assign all variables to false, the remaining variable to false. So substantially, solving horn, horn form is very, with DPLL is very, very easy. You just have to more slightly modify the, the, the code and say run well run a unipropagation up front which is already done uh, automatically by a solver 
and tell the SOT solver to always assign the negative values to the, to the faults. Okay? So you don't need to backtrack. Right? Well, of course, you, are, you have to be aware that this is horn and so that you can stop when, uh, if this fails, it returns a stop. Okay? But if you do that, you, you are done. Right? Okay, let me see some example. Let me show you some. Okay, so substantially, horn sat reduces to this very, very simple algorithm, which is unipropagate. Apply unipropagate to infinite points. Well, unipropagate is the user repetition at, until a fixed point uh, of, uh, of unipropagation. Okay. If uh, the result of unipropagation, the form is simplified to false, then you return on sat. Otherwise, you can assign all variables, uh, all variables to false, all the remaining variables to false, and then you have a model. Okay. So why is this of interest? Because some uh, such sol some such solvers uh, uh, have devices to recognize uh, when uh, the well having a, a completely horn formula as input is not so frequent, right? But it may be the case that after a few variables are assigned, the form is simplified into a horn clause and into horn formula. And then if your such solver is able to detect this fact, then after that is able immediately to recognize and uh, assign everything to false. Okay, so for instance, if your form if your form is not far from being horn, so it has very, very few clauses which are which are not non-horn, you can uh, adopt the following heuristics. Choose variable first on non-horn clauses, okay? And uh, after that, uh, assign uh, all variables to false, okay? In this way, you tend to uh, eliminate non-horn clause and try, and then once you have eliminated all non-horn clause, the solution of the horn form is uh, immediate, is linear, okay? Is this clear? Okay. Yes. Uh, okay, so an example. So if uh, you may see this is a horn, okay, so because yes, one, every close, this is on one, this is one, this is none, this is one, this is one, and you have one uh, unit literal here, so you run unit propagation, okay? After running uh, unit propagation here, Okay, you end up simply where this is a simple case where you a horn clause, a horn formula is unsat. Notice that a horn formula is unsat only. So if a formula on form is unsat, you are able to detect it by just unit propagation. Because if uh, after unit propagation you end up not to have completely simplified, you end up not having. Uh, um, uh, detected unsatisfiability, then it's satisfied because it's sufficient to assign all the tooth values to false. Okay, so this is the case. So, in, in this other case, instead you, you apply unit propagation here, then you end up having this uh, formula which is a horn, okay, because this has two one positive value each. So it's enough to conclude that you just apply all uh, variables to false, okay? So if you apply all variables to false, this means that a, this uh, tooth assignment satisfies a one, this satisfies this other uh, clause, and that's it, okay? So every tooth assignment assigning a three to true, a four to true, a two to false, a five to false, and also a one and a two to false, Okay, this is relevant, then satisfies the form. Okay. May I ask a question? Yes. Uh, would uh, it be the case that the same approach works uh, if uh, instead of having horn clauses, we have uh, a constraint uh, like uh, every clause has at least uh, one negative literal? Yeah, of course. Yes. 
uh, it, it will work uh, the same, but the, you can, then you can uh, convert it into horn closer by just toggling a positive literal with negative literals. So you can recognize a priori. So it's a part, the case that you mentioned is a particular subcase of this, of, uh, where is it? Of this case here. just just toggling uh, the value of all the reason why horn clauses are used uh, refer to having one positive literal depends on, on the fact that uh, they come from this situation here which was very frequent in some uh, fields like uh, um, logic programming for instance years ago okay but of course you are perfectly right what you are mentioning is if you think about that is it just an extreme case of this case? Okay, thank you. I have to think a bit about that. Uh, no, I mean, convince myself, think, but I no, think you. about that. If you have a formula in which uh, 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 you have at most one negative literal every close, okay, you just rename all variables a1, a2, a3 such that with B1, B2, B3, such that B1 if and only if uh, not A1, B2 if and only if uh, uh, not B2, okay? Uh, yes, okay, but the opposite, okay? Just I, maybe I express myself uh, not in a correct way. I was thinking if you have at least uh, one negative literal per close. At least, well, uh, no, because you can have, uh, a, so if you have a close of, of, of size uh, four, you have, uh, you may have at least, no, I mean, even of size three, if you have at least one uh, uh, negative variable per, uh, per close, you may have the other two positive. And uh, why wouldn't uh, assign everything to false uh, work in this setting? Ah, at, ah, sorry, at least, oh yeah, okay, yes. I know what you mean, yes, okay, fine. Yes, at least one negative value, see. Well, at least a uh, negative value for, for a close, yes. This is one another case. There are other subcases like that. I mentioned horn because horn occurs quite frequently in some situations. Okay. Okay, yeah, of course, this is another case that you, uh, you mean which you, you currently mentioned, okay? Okay. Yeah, no, you're perfectly right. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, we, uh, so I've lost where we are. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Um, another important case is uh, uh, two CNF. Well, um, how many of you have taken a, a complexity course? A course in, in complexity? So, mm -hmm. okay, how many people yes. never, never saw complexity theory? Well, you may know, so those who have uh, taken a course in complexity know that a three is a, mag is a magic number for complexity, right? So many problems with three sat, uh, three, uh, three coloring, uh, three something is uh, RMP complete. So it's typically, there is some parameter in some problem in which uh, with two probably is polynomial, if this parameter is three is NP and P hard, okay? The typical case is sat, three sat, from uh, K sat, so if you have uh, at least, if you have clauses of three elements, the problem is MP complete. But if you have all clauses are, have a small or equal than two elements, then the problem is uh, polynomial. Okay? So a two CNF, for, and this also holds for other problems, like for instance, coloring. Two coloring is uh, trivially polynomial, three coloring is uh, an NP complete, and uh, four coloring is NP complete, blah, blah, blah. So there is a well known, uh, there is a well known transformation due 
due to CARP, uh, which is able to convert K KCNF formula into an equivalent satisfied by free CNF formula, provided K is bigger. Okay, so you can so three is uh, the separation between two and three is uh, the K point, uh, so the uh, of uh, between uh, the borderline between polynomial and, uh, and complete. Okay. Um, Okay, so a two CNF form is a CNF form in which each clause has at most two literals, like that, for instance. Checking the satisfiability of two CNF formulas requires polynomial time. Why? Okay, uh, there are two ways of seeing. Uh, so, similar to what uh, Chun Tian suggested for Horn, uh, you can see this graphically. So, one way, non algorithmic, but very intuitive way of seeing why every two CNF formula is uh, um, can be solved in polynomial time, you can build a dependency graph. So remember, build the implication graph, remember, is uh, uh, take all binary clauses, OK? Um, a binary clauses uh, implies uh, uh, an implication between the two literals, right? A or B. Uh, it means that not A implies B and not B implies A. Okay? Are we there? So if we build the implication graph where we have uh, all nodes are literals, you, and all binary clauses can be represented of, of, of arcs, can represent arcs in this graph. Okay? Okay. Then, if this formula has a cycle containing both AI and not AI for some index I, then the formula is inconsistent. This is an if and a leaf. If it's not, this is not inconsistent. Okay? Well, obviously, if uh, you have that an implication graph, this means that a, um, AI implies not AI, but it's also as a cycle that not AI implies AI. So that AI is, is equivalent to not AI, which is obviously false. Okay, so your formula is inconsistent. So from your formula, you are able to prove that AI implies not AI, which is of course uh, inconsistent. Well, you can uh, give a graph, uh, you can use a Tarshan algorithm or whatever your, is your favorite uh, version of um, uh, strongly connected component uh, algorithm, which is linear, I recall, and uh, you can detect uh, this. This all requires linear time. Let me give you a simple example about that. If you consider this formula here, okay, this is a binary, a binary formula with the one unit here. You can build the implication graph. So for instance, uh, when you have the clause A1 or A2, this is not that you have one, one uh, node for AI and one node for not AI, okay, for every node. So A1 or A2, okay, may, means that not A1 implies A2 and not A2 implies A1, okay? Okay, do the same for all those clauses, okay? Well, once you have built this graph, uh, you notice that you have substantially two strongly connected component here. Well, no, well, not two strongly connected component because this is not. Um, we, uh, you have uh, some uh, uh, graph here, uh, and you have one strongly connected component here, which contain both a five and not a five, and a six and not a six. Okay. From which you can conclude this form is unsatisfiable, right? In fact, this contains this block here, which is obviously unsatisfiable because it cuts all possible combination between A5 and A6. Notice that an alternative way of uh, solving is just again run unipropagation at the beginning, which will make you eliminate all this uh, all this formula here, and then just keep reason on uh, the purely 2CNF formula, okay? Is this clear? Any question yes. about this fact? Mm, yes. 
Okay. Go ahead. What is the question? Who, sorry, who has, who is asking the question? Um, nobody, but I have one. <laughs> Uh, who is speaking? I don't get. Chen Tian. Ah, okay, yeah. Uh, this algorithm, is it a polynomial to the number of literals or to the number of clauses? Ah, uh, okay, good question. Uh, ha, uh, good. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, well, not well. This is uh, on both because uh, it's also polynomial in the, uh, in the number of... Uh, well. The notion of polynomial means is polynomial or the size formally means on the size of the representation of the problem. So how many bits do you need to represent a problem? So this is formally the notion of complexity theory, right? Well, when you speak of complexity on a graph, you mean uh, typically the sum of the number of arcs and the sum of uh, nodes. Okay, so when you see in a, when you, um, when you say a problem is, say, linear in the size of the graph, you mean on the sum of the nodes and of the arcs of the graph. Okay, so the answer is uh, substantially, you may think, is polynomial in the sum of, of the, you can think in the, of the sum of number of variables and number, sum of number of uh, clauses. Or you can even think it polynomial the number of closes because, of course, the number of closes is greater or equal than the number of variables, right? Okay. And the reason is that the Tarjan algorithm is linear in the size of the close, where close is, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, is linear in the size of the graph. Tarjan algorithm is uh, linear in the size of the graph where the size of the graph is given as uh, the sum of the number of edges and the number of nodes. Okay, so since we are speaking, every edge is a binary close, we are speaking of binary closes. Here the edges are twice as many the number of closes and the, the number of nodes are twice as many the number of variables. Yes, I just realized uh, that's not a meaningful question because we have binary uh, clause here. So basically the number of edges in this graph is at most uh, a square of the number of uh, literals, maybe yeah, a, in this, uh, yes, something in like general, that. Yes. General, so it's yes. always a polynomial. This is not in general the case, but here since we have binary clauses, yes. You're right. Okay, okay. No, I mean, it, it was definitely a meaning question because it allowed us to clarify this value. Okay, thank you very much for the question. Okay. Well, in addition, sorry, yeah? you are talking about about a linear time algorithm. So basically having a square there changes things. It's linear. It's not only polynomial is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back, no, no, I mean, yeah, I mean, costly speaking is polynomial. So the, the big, uh, when, yeah, you, yeah. when you, want, you wonder whether it's polynomial or, non -poly, or, or NP, right? Or an uh, or NP complete, right? And uh, okay, in particular, it's, uh, it's linear in the size of, of the formula. Okay. Uh, Rico, did I answer? Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, so what do you do in practice? Well, you can write and also, so, so apart from working with graph, you can see also doing the logical reasoning that this is the case. Uh, okay, so first of all, we notice that in general, you can run a unit. So if, um, we can, uh, when you speak of two CNF formulas, we can assume uh, without loss of generality that uh, all clauses have exactly two, clo two literal because uh, we can run a unipropagation up front, right? So the very first thing we, we can do is run unipropagation so that we get rid of all unary clauses. And well, if it returns SAT, we are done, okay? If it returns unsat, sorry, we are done. Otherwise, we have a, a formula which is all variables have purely two clauses, okay? Two binary clauses. So if you get rid of unary clauses, okay? Is it clear? Okay, here, in order to understand why it's tractable, 
Um, I wanted you to go straight to this point here, uh, this uh, hint, and uh, think about one very important fact. So suppose you have, uh, in general, a, a formula which uh, contains uh, clauses greater than, uh, whose size is greater than U2, okay? So what I called uh, greater than 2 CNF, right? So not only two binary clauses. Suppose you assign, okay, your formula is not CNF, and suppose you add one, you assign one literal to true. Okay, so if you assign to literal and then a BCP um, a Boolean constraint propagation is substantially another name for uni, uh, uni propagation till fixed point. Okay, if you apply Boolean constraint propagation after having a starting assigned from one literal, and as a result, this is unsat. The formula, uh, you are able that uh, this formula here is unsat. Then you can conclude nothing in general, right? Because uh, you have also to check that fab n not l is unsat, right? But think of the branching case of, uh, of, um, uh, of DPLL, right? This is actually what, what you do in the decision step of uh, DPLL. You have a formula, you decide, okay, given you have no determinacy step, so you assign L to true, uh, try assign the first round of Boolean constant propagation, then recursively check this is unsat. If this is unsat, you cannot conclude that this, the form is unsat, right? Okay. Are we there so far? Yeah. Okay, the surprising fact for 2CNF is that if you do, and your, all your formula is 2CNF, if you take one literal, assign it to true, apply Boolean propaga constraint propagation, and then you recursively found out that this, the result is unsat, then you can conclude that phi is on sat. Why is this the case? The reason is that um, when uh, you um, you assign, so take one formula and uh, you assign uh, BCP, the resulting formula is a subset of clauses of the, the original formula. Why? Because you cannot have clauses in which uh, some literals have been assigned. Why? Because if only some literal have been, one or literal has been assigned, then you have a, a unit literal. And a unit literal is uh, unit propagated. Do you get the point? So, the key point is to understand this equality here. Oh, if, uh, this is phi two, right? So for some phi two. So substantially, if uh, you take a formula, which is two CNF, assign one literal and you apply Boolean constraint propagation, what you have is a subset of the original clauses. But all the remaining clauses are part of the original formula. So there are not, there are no variable assignment, literal assignment inside that. Uh, so if I understand well, yeah. the, the variables that uh, have been unipropagated form the, the phi 2 in this, uh, in this sense, right? No, no, this is the phi 2 is the remaining part, right? Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Sorry, no, yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, I'm phi two is the part which is wiped away by unipropagation, which are made true okay. by unipropagation. Perfect. Okay. No, but the very important fact that you have to understand is this is that BCP of phi and I, all the clause there are a subset of the clause from the original, which is not the case here, because with three and F. Some of those clauses here may have some uh, literal less. The 
Okay, so you have a three close, you have unit propagator L, and you now you have a two close, which is no more a subset of the original. Okay, but this cannot be the case here, right? Because if after assigning unit propagation, you cannot have one formula, one clause, which is which subsumes the original one. Because it, if you assign some little there, it becomes a unit clause. And a unit clause is, is a, a unit propagated away by BCP. You see that? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Now that you, we have seen this, of course, this means that if this formula is unsat, also this formula is unsat, of course. This is the end, yeah, the end of an unsat formula with something else. So you can conclude that BCP of phi n L is, if, if BCP of phi and L is unsat, then the original form is unsat. Okay. Do you get it? Yeah. So there's no backtracking. Or, well, there's only one step one backtracking. No. The one particular case where you backtrack it, but this is just a length one. So you, now, I mean, this fact here is the source of non, of non determinism, right? You have two branches, sub branches, one, uh, two sub uh, trees, one for that true, one for that false, right? But if you're able to, so once, so in the standard PLL, if you're able to prove that BCP, that uh, fire and L is unsat, then you have to check also find that. So you have two sub branches. This is duplicate the search. This is what the region of the exponential blow up, right? To SAT, you don't have this. You don't have this because you are guaranteed that there is, due to thanks to unit propagation and thanks to the fact that you two clauses, you have that if this is unsat, then this SAT. This is the key idea which suggests uh, this simple algorithm, which is the following. Okay, you repeat uh, until the formula simplifies either to true or false, which is. Okay, first of all, well, assuming a, a two CNF formula without unit closure in the sense that you have already unit propagated it, okay? If you add one liter to phi and unit propagate, so obtain this formula here, okay? Well, if L is false, then you have to try the same with not L, but this is just for uh, one, uh, um, the case of uh, one uh, uh, step, right? Um, well, actually, if you don't need even need this step, actually, yeah. Mm. Okay. So the point: if any is false, great, you're done. Otherwise, you can do a recursive check. Okay. If phi prime is satisfiable, then phi is satisfiable. Okay, great. So if you recursively check that this is satisfiable, then of course it's satisfiable. But the good news is that if you are able to check that this is unsatisfiable. Okay, you can conclude that the form is unsatisfiable due to this property. Okay. Uh, professor. Yeah. How do we guarantee that uh, this BCP phi and L, uh, the result is always uh, uh, strictly smaller than the original uh, uh, formula. Because this is a two, two CNF. So are you asking for this? Yes, and um, yes, you, you said that this PCP result is a subset of the original file, but is it a strict uh, subset? Uh, ah, ah, okay, it's at least, you mean, uh, so, well, I, uh, okay, uh, as, well, I assume that the variable, of course, you are doing, uh, well, I'm implicitly assuming that L, the variable in L occurs in phi, of course. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't Okay, I see. Yeah, you're right. Well, of course, you are. 
we are branching on variable which are called phi. Of course, if the literal is uh, one of the original formula, then this process uh, always uh, result a smaller formula. Then yes, it must uh, terminate. Think about, that. think about that. This item may mean two things. If it occurs positively in the clause, then uh, there is a one clause which at least one clause which will be reduced. Okay. If it occurs negatively, then uh, there will be a one clause which will cause another unit. And then that unit, for, of course, of course, positively in the formula. And so uh, the next uh, round of BCP will be eliminated and that clause will be eliminated. So assuming that this, the I didn't say that, yeah, you're right. But the, I, the, there was an implicit assumption that the L here, the variable of L is in, occurs in five. Uh, well, otherwise it would not make, make, make sense to do that. Well, if it didn't occur, well, this means that this step is completely useless. Okay. But then at the next step, you will do that. So sooner or later, you'll use literal than, uh, than are here, right? So it may be the case that sometimes you, get, you bump into a literal, into a variable which is, doesn't occur uh, yet on the formula because the formula has been being simplified, blah, blah. You're right. But this means that if this happens, well, this step does nothing, okay? And then the next step, sooner or later, you'll bump into a, into a variable that will, uh, will be there, right? At the end of this cycle, you will take, analyze all the variables which occur in the formula. So let me add something. So yeah. during this repeated process, uh, uh, each at each round the five prime becomes smaller it may be possible that uh, some literals they just uh, disappear during this one cycle so, so say, at, say it again sorry i didn't hear you can you repeat? Uh, i mean uh, when you compute the five prime from the original five in yeah. each round it's yeah. possible that uh, many literals just uh, uh, disappeared yes after the uh, the, the burden uh, propagation. So oh, yeah, sorry, I forgot to say here, add one literal I, L in phi. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, that's the point. That's okay. What sorry, I, 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 didn't, I didn't say I didn't say that, but this is part of it. Please, it was in, I didn't say because I made this implicitly. Sorry. I yeah, it's, it's say obvious. Add one liter L in five. Sorry, I should have said this in this place. Sorry if this was misleading. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, so the key point is that what you can do is just well run a unit propagation up front. If on sat, if this is enough, then you can return on sat. If this is simplified to true, then return sat, of course. This. So if not, you are guaranteed that you are, your form is a pure to sat. All crosses are two. And so just pick one literal, uh, just save it, and uh, unipropagate it. And uh, if uh, you got false, then uh, you, you toggle them. And uh, however, after this process, if uh, phi is true, then return on sat. If phi is true, then return on sat. And then you do that until you get sat or unsat. The key point here is that you don't have any uh, you don't have any um, backtracking. It's just a process that goes through that. Okay, you see, you don't have a many backtracking, no exponential here. You have only the number of loops you have here is just, at most case, the, the number of remaining variables. Okay, so no. You see no recursive code here. So this is linear. Okay. Is it clear? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, okay. So let me make some examples. If we have the same problem as before, when we run unit propagation initially, okay. Then we start deciding, for instance, uh, selects not 
A6, uh, we, with not X6, we have that uh, we uh, have, uh, sorry, not a five, not that we backtrack only on one step, so only one, one branch, so only this case uh, here, positive and negative. Okay. And then after that, where is it? Sorry. Uh, okay. So we just, uh, if uh, only one branch goes to false and then we backtrack and then we try A6 to true and again is unsat. So we can conclude this from the unsat. Not that the, the branching can is at last costs you at most one round of unit propagation. Uh, if uh, instead the form is satisfiable, so if we drop one clause, then what you do is again run new propagation, then you select not a six, you backtrack, and then select a six, and then this is sat. Okay, note that you do have in this case here is interesting because you need, uh, notice that you need one this one step backtrack. Right, because when you uh, let's say you are here, no, sorry, where is it? This one, we are here, okay. So, okay, we have a simplified uh, a one to a four, okay, no problem. Now, you um, you decide a six to false, okay, and uh, and then uh, you you get uh. Uh, you you find uh, an inconsistency, then uh, you cannot conclude uh, that the formula is uh, inconsistent. Okay, you because in fact this is not right. You still have to try at least that singularly a six assigned to true. The, the the other case, but the other case reduces only to unit propagation. Okay. We there? Yeah. Okay. So I yeah. think. Uh, okay. <clears throat> um, do you want me to make an interval or just go straight with the last uh, topic and then close? I. For me, you can continue. Do anybody want to have a? A break. Sorry, I get longer. Oh, guys, I am in general. I never. I, I told you in advance that you should have. You should tell me because I. I, I sometimes I don't realize that uh, <laughs> I should need uh, an interval. So you feel free to, to interrupt me and say, "Well, it's time to have a, a break." Okay. 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 Uh, let me go through some. Uh, well, this uh, topic here, which is just for speculative and theoretical interest. So you may, if you bump into AI pro, into AI papers and the complexity paper refer to SAT, you may often bump into this problem with, the, with this phenomenon, which we have in, uh, in SAT, which is uh, what's called a phase transition. Okay. Uh, in general, this is a purely theoretical consideration, so uh, experimental theoretical consideration. In general, KCNF is all CNF is such that all clauses have K literals, right? So, for instance, 2CNF is polynomial, and the SAT for uh, KCNF for K greater than equal than 3 is, uh, um, is MP complete, right? Okay. Uh, uh, okay, that's what I, I was mentioning. Remember that every KCNF formula can be converted into 3CNF. And this was due to CARP. And this is very uh, basically, uh, every, you can write a K clause into a conjunction of three clauses as follows. Take the first two literals and rename, rename the remaining one with a, a fresh variable, B1. Okay, so this leads to L1 and uh, L1, L2 and B1. And then you want to encode that B1 is, is 
L3 or L4, L5, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But now rename um, L4, L5, L6, blah, blah, as B2. So this means since you have defined this as B1, okay, you may say, okay, I substitute this to B1 and say not B1 is L3 or L4, all F5, all F6, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So you can add the heat not to be one or L3 or L4, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But now do the same with uh, L4, L5, L6, blah, 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 and call it B2. Okay. So you substitute B2 here and you say not B2 or L4 or not, not B3 and so on and so forth. At the end of the day, you end up having not BK minus four and LK minus two or BK minus three and not BK minus three implies LK minus one or LK. Okay, notice that this is very, very similar to what to the second version of our synthesization. So you introduce a fresh variable naming some formula which occurs positively in the formula. Okay, this clause here occurs positively in the clause, right? Okay, so you call it B1. So you write this as L1 or L2 or B1, and then you add B1 implies L1, blah, 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 blah. That is not B1 or L3 or L4 or L5, blah, blah, blah. blah. Okay, but then, or you rename B2. You call B2, uh, sorry, uh, you rename the, the subclause L4, L5, blah, 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 as B2, and so on and so forth. This is a technique introduced by CARP. I uh, don't know what, whether you know who CARP is. He's a very famous complexity theorist, the guy who made uh, uh, prove that. Uh, 23 very important problems were NP complete. Okay, and uh, all the theory of NP complete started. So Cook proposed the, the, the notion of NP completeness, and Karp proved uh, that 23 very famous problems were NP complete. And so this all started the NP complete stuff. Okay, so substantially every key CF formula can be converted into 3 CNN. Okay, so you can generate randomly. Uh, randomly um, KCNF formulas of n variables and then close as follows. So you can pick with uniformly probability a set of k atoms over n. So pick randomly three atoms over n and you randomly negate each atom with the probability 0 0.5. Okay, so the equivalent, so you, every atom can occur uh, with the equal probability as positive or negatively and create a disjunction of the resulting neutrons. This is the way you create a random clause. And then you generate until you have L different clauses generating this way. This means that every time you, you generate a clause that you have already generated, you throw it away and redo it, okay? So you can generate and case in a formula with N variables and L clauses. Okay, so what happened? This was a phenomenon, a very strange phenomenon, which was found by Selman and Kauth a long time ago, which is some curiosity. If you fix K and M, and for increasing L, you randomly generate and solve uh, problems with uh, K, L, N uh, for the increasing variable, and then you plot the satisfiability percentage and the mean or geometrical mean CPU time taken, against the duration of L over M. And you have some funny situation. So, well, not surprisingly, if you randomly generate problems and you increase the number of clauses, unsurprisingly, you pass at a given moment from 100% satisfiable to 100% unsatisfiable formula, right? This is not surprising. 
with a low clause, few with a given number of, of variables with a few clauses or probably tend to be satisfied, but as long as you add the clauses, they become progressively more unsatisfiable, right? And then the funny thing is that the decay becomes steeper with M. Okay, so the, if you increase N for very big formulas, then this passage becomes very abrupt, nearly leaning to a step. And for it was found that for n going to infinite, to plus infinite, of course, the plot converged to a step in the crossover point about 4.28. So when the number of clauses is 4.28 times the number of variables. This is for k equals 3. You have a similar results for k equals 4, 5, uh, blah, blah, blah. And this is a phenomenon which is called uh, in, uh, the phase transition. And uh, this was, uh, we were able to find, uh, people were able to find the uh, main relation with the thermodynamics on that. And, um, um, okay. So first of all, you notice that, well, this is an experiment I ran, but this, I didn't have much time, so I ran only on 200 variables. This is, if I remember correctly, on a sample on uh, 100 sample per point. And you see the probability, the number of uh, the percentage of uh, SAT problems were 100% and then passing down to 0%. And the more variable, so this is the number of clauses divided by number of var. And uh, this becomes steeper and steeper as long as that you increase the number of variables. So ideally, if you go more than 1,000 variables, blah, 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 those problems get very near to a steep. Um, uh, a step, sorry. Okay. What's the funny thing? Of, and, and this is became steeper and steeper around 4.28. So why is this interesting? Because surprisingly, what happens is then not all. Okay, so the funny thing is that this ratio is common to all variables. So this is, there's a linear. So the, the number where you become steeper is 4.21 times the number of variables, even if you increase the variables. Okay, so they cross around this point here. And what is uh, in, in interesting is that we pass, so this is not only a percentage of uh, solution, SAT or non-SAT, but it's also a measure of the hardness of the problem. Because problems here are very hard here. So initially, a very easy problems, you pass to very hard problems, and then problems go down to hard problems. And the peak is exactly around the 50% satisfiable point. And as the, the step, also the decay becomes steeper with N. With N. So for n going to infinite, the plot converts to an impulse in the crossover point of 434. So you have easy problem, and the funny thing is that easy problems are increased polynomially with n, whereas for values greater equal than 3.8, the problem increases exponentially with n. So what you have is a situation like this. So this is the the geometric the median time taken by solving uh, problems, and what you notice that uh, well again uh, these are not so easy not so hard but you notice that corresponding to the easy or easy part, so the satisfiable decay the point when you have a fifty percent satisfiable is very very hard okay it's the peak of hard and surprisingly. So you may think that the hardness of a problem increases with increases with the size, right? No, that's surprising, right? 
So if you increase the number of clauses at a given point, the problem becomes easy, easier. Why is this the case? Well, substantially, okay, so this is geometrical mean and, and uh, median. So why is this the case? Substantially, when you are below this value here, you have, the problem is under constrained. You have too few clauses. So the problem finds quite quickly a, a solution, okay? When you have uh, enough clauses, well, this is not obvious. So it takes a lot of search to find a, a solution. Either this is satisfiable or unsatisfiable, right? So when uh, this, this is the maximum uncertainty on, uh, on the solution, it takes a long time to, to find a solution. Okay, or to detect whether there is none. But when you are in the unsatisfiable, so what happens when you start incrementing the constraint? When you start incrementing the constraint, uh, it's easier that you bump. So after a few assignments, you get uh, into a satisfiability. Okay, so you violate the formula after a few a few assignments. So what it means? It means that it takes less to detect unsatisfiability on single branches. So you still have an exponential behavior, but with the, we, you still have an exponential tree, but the tree is, to, is uh, shorter because the pruning power increases. So here you have uh, till 3.8, you have a polynomial behavior. So here gross polynomial. So if you increase n and keep uh, uh, the number of closer number of var var low, you increase polynomially in this direction. But then you here you start increasing exponentially. You have the maximum exponentiality here. After that, you are still exponential, but with a higher pruning power. Okay, so the ex the exponential is you reduce the number of variables which are relevant for your exponent for your exponent yes. um, but in this graph we are dealing with random generated problem yes which can be either satisfiable or unsatisfiable yes but if we only look at those satisfiable cases yes. can we safely say that uh, a problem with more clauses uh, it's always harder to solve. No, satisfiable instances, if you have a satisfiable instances, okay, the, if you add the clauses, it's hard to solve. But the point here that in the, the way, so here, so here are 100% satisfiable, okay? And so the more clauses you add, the more, the more, uh, the harder is the problem, okay? Now you start having some unsat formulas. So you may think that for satisfiable formulas, you have something which is, of course, in, always increasing. So sat formulas are, the hardness of sat formula is, of course, always increasing. The hardness of unsat formula is typically decreasing instead. But the problem is that in this area, you have substantially no unsat formulas. And in this area, you have substantially no sat formula. Okay, so here, this is dominated by the sat formula. Okay, so the behavior is dominated by the sat satisfiable formulas. Here, this is dominated by the unsatisfiable formulas. Okay. Is this clear? Well, well, maybe I didn't uh, ask the right question. Yeah. Uh, I was assuming that if we keep adding uh, clause, more clauses to a yeah. uh, given um, a set of clauses, yeah. it's possible that uh, the increasing uh, problem is always uh, uh, satisfiable. But during this process, uh, I assume that, uh, no, I think that uh, 
the problem is actually becoming harder and harder. Is that no. Uh, true? No, okay. So if you look at, to the percentage of a satisfiable, the more close, well, remember that you are fixing uh, the number of variables, right? The number of variables are fixed, okay? So the more closes that you add, the more constraints you add. So uh, with a few constraints, all formula are satisfiable. When you add one more, well, the, uh, the number of satisfiable instances are, the, the likelihood that your formula is unsatisfiable decreases dramatically, right? Well, is this clear, this picture? I mean, the more closes you add, the more constraint you add, the more candidate models you cut, right? Remember, a three formula, a three close, cuts uh, two to the n minus three candidate models, right? Okay, is this clear? So the more, what? the more closer you add, the more candidate models you cut until the, the, no one remains. So this is the, from the purely satisfied B percentage of satisfied B, the more go, you go up, uh, the more a formula likely becomes unsatisfiable. These are randomly generated formula, right? I've made this with the 100 samples, but the people did the experiments with uh, hundred thousands of samples, the point, okay? And this is exactly the behavior, okay? So this, the behavior is that you pass from 100% satisfiable to 100% unsatisfiable, okay? Is it clear so far? Uh, yes, yes. Sir. So far it is, right? Now, what, how much time do you, do you take to solve each of these instances? When you are here, this is typically the problem is under constrained, okay? So by search you, so this means that you have many, many, more, many, many tooth assignments that are models here, right? So it's quite far easy to find one. So if you have many variables and very few clauses, this means that just by a taint, you have very, very high probability to get a model. So you, you typically find it quite, quite fast. Okay. Okay, so far. The more clauses you add, the more search. So the more branching you fail. So this means that in a few branches, you, you get very quickly to a solution, right? When you are here. The more problems you get, the more branches will fail, okay? So you will end up having an exponential amount of branches before finding one or finding there is none, okay? Okay, so I think uh, that the fact that this increases here is not surprising. Till here, the fact is not surprising. So that in the hardness increases here. What happens here is that uh, now, after that, this is dominated by unsat unsatisfiable problems because most problems from now on are unsatisfiable. When you have an unsatisfiable problem, okay, if you add further clauses, you make take less time to solve. Why? Because the branch, you realize that a branch is unsatisfiable earlier. Okay? So you still have an exponential branching, but the branch is cut earlier. So the more closer you add, when you are in, in nearly 100% satisfiable, the complexity decreases. Why is this the case? Because you still have an exponential behavior, but it takes less. So you still have an exponential amount of branches, but the branches are cut higher. So think of a complete binary tree. 
okay? Whose high is the number of variables, okay? In a satisfied way, you have in principle to explore all. But if you are able to cut the tree in this height, then the problem is still exponential, but the but it decreases. Do you get this? I see you are perplexed. Okay. I mean, this is, I, I, I wanted to explain this because it's a well-known fact. You may find it somewhere. Uh, <laughs> and it's one fact, the surprising fact. That, so I just wanted to say that the, the, num the complexity of the hardness of the formula is a combination of uh, number of variables, so degrees of freedom, and uh, of uh, um, and the, of the size of the program, so number of constraints. And it may sound in, even counterintuitive that increasing the number of constraints, given the number of variables, the problem could be even easier, become easier. And the reason is that you over, when you start over constraining a problem, then uh, your pruning power of uh, your uh, search is able to cut you earlier. Okay. Okay, guys. So notice that this is a si sort of side branch of, uh, of, of SAT. This is just a theoretical consideration that you may bump into from time to time. This has been discussed years ago and there are many people. This has a theory, why, why is this of interest? Well, this is only because, for instance, randomly generated problem in, within this peak uh, are typically used as uh, benchmarks for testing such solvers. Okay, because uh, you can this is a way of building uh, problems which seems to be hard for every such solver. So the interesting one of the interesting part is that this problem problem around this peak here seems to be very hard for all such solvers. So there is no such solver which is particularly good in solving this. There are some which are better, some are better or worse, but they are universally hard and to substantially every such solver exhibit this peak. So those are hard problems for everybody. And they are much used because uh, people is interested to try to figure out what makes uh, uh, an NP complete problem hard. Okay, so this is the reason why this is considered interesting because uh, well, they create hard problems and this can give you some, so the compromise of uh, uncertainty and size is uh, what makes you very hard, makes your problem very hard, okay? So on one hand, uh, here you, you are not more able, uh, so when you are here, on one hand, uh, uh, you need exploring substantially all the search space. On the other hand, exploring every branch, uh, in exploring every branch, you can, uh, you don't have any pruning power. Okay, because it takes you very near to full, to explore the full branch. So here, most problems, uh, you have a, a very high percentage of uh, of tooth assignment, which are models. So you, you typically find one very quickly. Here, uh, the problem is over constrained. So uh, you have an potential and exponential amount of, prob of uh, assignment to explore, but typically you realize that the candidate's assignment is, uh, uh, is bound to be uh, unfeasible very quickly. So you still have an exponential search, but uh, you cut the height very, very much. In between, is where the real hard problems are. Okay. Okay. So this has nothing to do with the algorithm of issue. I just just an issue which uh, is you may bump into if uh, uh, if in particular on AI and if you know all the, all the 
Ah, by the way, similar behavior has been found in many other NP-complete programs. So this uh, peak, uh, ECRDC peak uh, centered uh, in the 50% satisfiable uh, uh, point uh, is uh, something which has been shown in many other uh, NP-complete programs. So this is of general interest uh, for the theoretical viewpoint. Okay, so I conclude uh, uh, the class uh, for today. And uh, I, before you go, uh, I wanted to ask you something. Uh, some of you for tomorrow class, okay, so I, I think I can stop recording because this is just a non, non interesting. Uh, I just stopped the recording, okay.